My name is Abhishek Raman. I am a second year Master of Divinity degree candidate and a resident at the center. So this is also a living learning community. Um, we have about um, 20 um, or so students, um, both doctoral and master students, um, including research associates who live at the center, um, along with faculty and staff who have offices at um, up front. Today's event um, is first in a series of speaking engagements that we will be organizing at the center um, this semester on the theme of bridging business and belief. These events will explore what it means to be a person of faith um, and how that relates to how one should live, and in particular, how business is part of that quest. What are the connections between the quest to live a life of integrity, which for many people is often grounded in deep beliefs about faith, religion, or secular values, and our desire to succeed in the marketplace? Now, we live in a world today where more and more people are asking questions about how to connect business and religion. Our hope is that these events provide you the rare opportunity at Harvard to not only think about the, trans to not only think about the transactional nature of business, but also matters of the heart and soul about issues that transcend the realm of business and humanity that may have everything to do with the kind of manager or religious leader you want to be. So I also want to quickly note um, that our next event in the series will be on Tuesday, March 29th. Um, uh, and include some amazing alumni of the Divinity School who are now working in the business sector. Um, so there's a sign-up sheet um, up front um, on the table there. So if you um, give us your information, we'll keep you updated on the events um, as we get closer to the date. Today we have a distinguished panel of scholars who have explored and continue to explore these issues in their personal and professional lives. And we are very lucky to have them with us here today. So let me um, introduce our moderator for the evening, um, Derek Van Beaver. Derek is a senior lecturer of business administration in the general management unit at Harvard Business School. He teaches one of the most popular courses in the MBA second year elective curriculum called B Building and Sustaining a Successful Enterprise. He is also the director of the Forum for Growth and Innovation, a research project sponsored by Professor Clay Christensen that is focused on discovering, developing, and disseminating predictive theory on management in, and innovation. Derek is a co-founder of two publicly traded companies, the Advisory Board Company, which is a global research consulting and technology firm serving hospitals and university executives, and the Corporate Executive Board, a global thought leadership and advisory network. Derek has bridged the so-called divide between business and religion in his own life by not only getting his MBA from Harvard Business School, but also his Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School in 2011, where his thesis was titled A Mission Beyond Commerce, in which he examined the challenges to personal and corporate mission posed by pivot points, such as a change of ownership or leadership transition, and suggested practices and disciplines for retaining a sense of perspective in the high hurry of business life. You have done your homework. I have. Sure. I have. <laughs> um, Derek is. Derek is an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and we at the center are proud to call him and his family our neighbors. Um, thank you for being with uh, us here today, Derek, and I'll pass it over to you to introduce our panel. Good evening. Uh, I am really honored uh, to share this evening with two such distinguished leaders and teachers, um, and with all of you. But let me begin by thanking Abhishek for this evening. Uh, you used the royal we in talking about the program this semester and all the work we are doing. Uh, this is all Abhishek. <laughs> and um, those of us who are in this uh, business of trying to bring together uh, divinity and business, the HDS and HBS, know that the Charles River can be awfully wide and awfully cold. And uh, the work that you've done, it's all creativity and all leadership to do this uh, series and this evening. So thank you, Abhishek. Well done. Uh, and when we do cross that long, that broad, cold river, I think we give ourselves the opportunity to rediscover how much in common we actually have. Uh, I don't think Bill and Emily had met prior to this evening, but uh, they are both pioneers in their respective fields of leadership education on uh, each bank, either bank of the Charles. Bill through his publishing and course development at HBS, 
and Emily in her direction of a program of theological education here at HDS that's preparing many of its graduates for senior leadership roles immediately upon graduation. You know, it has been said that theological education is leadership education, and Emily, you and your team are responsible for carrying that aspect of the work forward, so uh, thank you and welcome to both of you. Um, it falls to me to suggest a plan for the evening, so here's what I propose. Uh, we run till 6.30. So I thought I'd split our time pretty evenly between um, me asking uh, Bill and Emily questions and then uh, making time for you all to ask them questions. Um, oh, oh, oh. OK. Um, uh, there are four areas I thought that we wanted to talk about tonight. First, uh, let's make a little space space for Bill to talk about the concepts behind his book, uh, True North and Authentic Leadership. Uh, Abhishek Everthorough has instructed me to tell you that we have copies of Bill's book available for sale this evening. Uh, we have no square capability, but we do have uh, the ability to take cash, check, or Venmo. So um, uh, I'd like to start by having Bill talk with us a little bit about uh, his work. Then um, maybe we can open it up and talk about the challenges of teaching leadership and learning to be a leader. Uh, I think it's hard on both sides of the equation. Third, uh, we can move to faith and leadership. And then finally, on this theme of crossing the Charles, uh, talk about uh, some past efforts at merging uh, business and religion teaching and perhaps what might be in store for us in the future. Um, uh, th I've wait, I have like, honestly, 16 questions, each of which would be an hour and a half, and so, uh, I'm just going to let's follow the energy and see where we go and have fun. Um, brief introductions, if I could, for people who don't need them. Uh, two different paths that led Bill and Emily to this evening. Bill is currently a senior fellow at HBS. Uh, he teaches now in the executive education uh, program largely, but he is the founder of one of the most popular courses in the elective curriculum at the business school, Authentic Leadership Development, or ALD in the shorthand of HBS. Uh, Bill told me yesterday that he, he's visiting now from Minneapolis and teaching 11 class sessions this week. So um, uh, idle hands are not his problem. Uh, he's the author of uh, four best-selling works on leadership, including this new revision of his book, Discover Your True North. Uh, and he was a leader in the business realm before that, most notably as chairman and CEO of Medtronic a healthcare company with a mission that Bill clearly loves. You can see it through his book and you see it in talking with him. Uh, the mission of Medtronic, if you would indulge me, to contribute to human welfare, to contribute to human welfare by application of biomedical engineering in the research, design, manufacture, and sale of instruments or appliances that alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. It's a mission that Bill felt deeply, and I suspect we're going to learn um, uh, is hardwired to his sense of true north in his life. So, Bill, thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, Emily is Assistant Dean, Emily Click is Assistant Dean for Ministry Studies and Field Education and a lecturer on ministry here at HDS. This, too, is not her first career. She was ordained in the United Church of Christ and draws on a decade of experience in congregational ministry in her teaching and counseling of students. I have been lucky enough to be one of those students, and Emily has taught me a thing or two about how people behave in swamps, how they get into them and how they get out of them. And uh, the wisdom that uh, you shared is one of my favorite stories of my time here. Uh, she teaches courses on leadership and administration, mentoring, and religious education here at the school. And she'd probably be too modest to say this, but she and her team are responsible for what I think is the most highly regarded field education curriculum in ministry studies, and uh, that is uh, not easy work. That is uh, slow, steady, patient build across time. And Emily, congratulations and welcome. <laughs> With that, why don't we uh, work our way through uh, our pastures, and I'll call our time at about um, 10 of 6. But Bill, for those of you who haven't yet read your book, could you uh, help us understand the theory behind Discover Your True North, and help us uh, understand these um, uh, concepts of true north and authentic leadership? Thank you very much, Derek. I, I see leadership as a calling, and 
and uh, you have to discern where that calling comes from. It may take you many, many years to find that calling that's right for you. You may have to have many experiences. And I see your true north is finding that sense of who you really are at your deepest level. It's your most deeply held beliefs, the values you live by, and the principles you lead by. And I think all of us understand that. Uh, we could write it down if we do some discernment, but it's very easy to get pulled off course by pressures or seductions. And I've seen you talk about being in the swamps. I think a lot of people do get pulled off course by kind of the, the three great seducers, money, fame, and power, and the pressures we inevitably all face. But I think finding that calling is essential to all of us. I used to start out with this, but I found we really have to build up to it because I think you have to go deeply into who you are, and it takes a lot longer to discern who you are than one might think. I think it starts with your life stories, and it takes, uh, the, the most significant thing is to focus on the crucible, because I think we all go through crucible times in our life. Sometimes I have people say, oh, my life's been perfect, I haven't gone through anything. I said, you know, if you do a little more reflection, thinking about it, describe your story, you'll find that you have gone through very difficult times. I mean, not as dramatic as some, but uh, it's in these times I think we come very close to the marrow of life, and we're forced to say, who am I in this world? Does my life matter? I remember my wife Penny went through that mid-career. She's gotten her doctorate in psychology six months before, formed a firm, and uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And the medical part was, I hate to say in retrospect, she's having her 20th anniversary this month of being cancer free, but it was relatively uh, straightforward in medical clinical terms. Mastectomy, and she said, you know, uh, surgery and hormonal and uh, chemotherapy and chemo hormonal therapy. But that wasn't what was really important. It's, I want to be whole in mind, body, and spirit. And uh, she found a whole new calling for her life beyond her field in psychology because she felt called to try to transform medicine. To, and I said, do you realize what you're taking on? I'm in the medical field, Medtronic. And she said, do you believe in me or not? But she has worked very hard the last 12, 14 years to transform medicine. So we look at the whole person. Instead of, as so much of Western medicine, right, over <coughs> here our own med Harvard Medical School, we teach it as a collection of body parts. And a lot of people are not very interested in the connection of those parts. There is definitely a mind-body connection. There's a lot of research that supports that. We are one human being in mind, body, and spirit. And if you deny the spirit side of yourself, I think you're denying perhaps the most important uh, side of yourself. And I think it's important to recapture that and call. I've had people suggest to me, is this really a religious book masked as a secular book? Well, the, it can be read that way. The book is for everyone. I don't want to exclude people because they either have no faith, no belief, uh, but it's an opening, it's an invitation. And as I say to students in the classroom, because Harvard Business School is very secular, is saying, you know, it can be the core of your religious belief. Uh, maybe you have no belief, maybe you're an atheist, uh, but we all have to address the existential questions of life. Why am I here? Does my life matter? What am I doing with the gifts I have? And, uh, and, you know, I've always believed we didn't create our own gifts. They came from our Creator. And so how do you use those gifts, in my case, being a Christian, to the glory of God? And uh, my whole underlying belief structure in life came from uh, uh, a passage from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. And I think Jesus is a wonderful figure, even if you're not Christian or you don't believe it, if you just want to look at the historical Jesus, fine, as opposed to the divine Jesus, that's fine. But he said, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glory or fire your Father in heaven. And I always felt that was like a mission and calling for my life. So uh, that we are, our life is very much uh, something that other people can look down on or they can emulate or they can look to or learn from. And I think that's how we... That's how we live our lives. And it could be for good or for ill. And I think so. I think by going and bringing out how people see their life and what's important. And so 
there are many people in this book that are uh, quite religious and many people who are not. And, uh, and I've taught, written in cases on a number of them and uh, in the classroom so we can see it through their, their views. And, but I think the essence of it is knowing who you are and how, how are you going to use your gifts in the world, whatever your gifts are, and how are you going to impact the world to make this world a better place. So at the end of the day, you can look back and say, you know, it wasn't perfect, made a lot of mistakes, but we did the best we could with the gifts we had, and yeah, I think we made a difference in the lives of people. I love the words of Robert F. Kennedy when he went to Johannesburg in 1966, a couple years before he was assassinated, and he said, you know, few will have the greatness to bend history itself. He happened to be in the shadow of Nelson Mandela, who was probably the greatest leader of my lifetime and really did bend history. But he said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us commit ourselves to a series of actions to make this world a better place. And the sum total of all those actions will write the history of this generation. And that's been my hope, that this generation of people coming up will do it better than my generation did, where we were into self-interest and things like that, and charisma and style and, you know, uh, if you will, a lot of things I just don't believe in. And I felt, uh, this sounds dismissive because there's some great leadership writers like Warren Bennis, and, uh, but there are also many who take us in the wrong direction and teach the wrong things. And so I just felt that I really had to write it. It's the essential you, it's who you are at your deepest level. And, but, uh, and can you be that person every day? Of course we deviate, I've deviated. But can we stay true to that? And that's the idea of the compass. Some of you are, who are Christians can look at it as the cross, but do we get pulled off course? And do we have an inner moral compass that pulls us back on course that, that will right that, if you will, our ship of life and bring us back to our real calling? Because it's very easy to get pulled off. The temptations, even if you're not into money, you can get pulled off by titles, you can get pulled off by opportunities, you can get pulled off by thinking you're better than you are because somebody writes a nice newspaper article about you or a magazine, or whatever it is, getting some award or something. At the end of the day, these things don't matter very much. They all go away, but what matters is who you are and the people you've touched in your life. And so what I'm trying to do is call out the best in people. There's another author at Stanford that just ripped on all this and said it's all nonsense. And that's not how the world works. And you're teaching people the wrong things. You have to lie to get ahead. <coughs> it, the opposite of what I believe in ahead was on a panel with him uh, in December. And I just said, you know, you can either call out the worst in people or the best in people. And, you know, people who are angry always have some anger. There's, you know, we haven't really processed what that's all about. You know, and I think if we can deal with those narcissistic wounds and hurts, we can see that there's growth in that. Okay, it was a tough experience. Maybe I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve my fiance to die when I was 26 or 25 years old and three weeks of the day before the wedding. She certainly didn't deserve to die, you know? And I don't believe that God's reaching down and calling her back and all that. I just, that's not my belief structure. I just believe in the words of St. Paul's I put in the book. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And I think we have to accept there are things in life we do not understand. And that's the process of discernment. And I think we do our best discern. Well, there's two ways to discern. You can go off on your own. I have to meditate. I've been meditating. Uh, I use transcendental meditation for the last 42 years. Or, you know, you can be with a group of people and share. And I think that sharing can be uh, extremely powerful. And I think we really need to do both. So uh, I've had a men's group that came out of a retreat we went on many years ago, uh, uh, called it a prayer group, but we don't pray that much, so it's a little inappropriate to call it that. But we share each other's lives, and we talk about really important topics. It meets every Wednesday. The problem is I'm here and they're in Minneapolis. And we have a couples group that travels together, and we meet once a month and talk about the really important things. So I'm just calling you. How do you keep your, how do you deal with the challenges of life? Who do you talk to? And I think, I'm really pleased to be here at the center, Derek, because it, I think the idea of people from different faiths and no faiths together is extremely important, that we share different views. And one of the things I've been teaching quite intensely, particularly the last year, 
is the importance of celebrating diversity. I think too often in our life we allow ourselves to be resegregated, not out of prejudice, but out of um, lifestyles. And I think it's really important we engage people of different faiths, different socioeconomic groups, different races, different religions, different sexual preference, obviously both genders, that we really engage and celebrate the diversity that we have in this room that is who we are and the fact that we can talk about these things. When I went to Medtronic, Derek, um, I would have to say it looked like the Norwegian Lutheran Church. Okay, nice Protestant place. Uh, we had the most important event of the year was the Christmas party, and it was called a Christmas party. And employee number eight, Earl Hatton, got up every year and read the Gospel of Luke. And I remember we having one Jewish vice president who came to me and he said, Bill, I don't think, Paul said, John, he said, I don't think I fit here. He was our head of science and technology. He said, I'm the only Jewish officer you have. I said, Paul, hang in there. There's going to be a lot more. Uh, and we changed the name to a holiday party. It's not a party at all. It's a program. And we bring in about 12 different uh, faith traditions, including Native American traditions at that time, and share that so that we kind of come to our own sense of who we are. Today, the Chief Executive Officer of Medtronic is Omar Ishraq. Omar was born in Bangladesh. He's a devout Muslim who has been to Mecca and done the Hajj, and I love to talk to him. I learned so much from him, just like I learned from Hindus going to Varanasi, or going to uh, have had the privilege of being with His Holiness the Dalai Lama 12 different times and doing a program with him programs with him, and my wife has gone to Dharamsala for two good solid weeks to sit in his living room. I mean, he doesn't have just a small living room, it's a living room going to work people this size, but, you know, talking about really important issues. So, I just think it's a privilege that we have to engage with people, different faiths. And I would, I would add to that, no faiths. So, I think we want to honor that, too, because I see us all as exploring. And uh, I think we are all my, my under core philosophy, and I'll stop, Derek, is we're all like spiritual pilgrims uh, on a pilgrimage. And we, we have our own track, but our tracks intersect. So we each are following our own path, but these paths intersect. And those intersections may come frequent or infrequently, but it's those intersections often that help us get back on track, that help inspire us, that help us understand our own track better by my understanding your track in your life and that sharing because I think we're all have that up to so I'll stop there um, my impulse is to say don't stop but um, uh, I want to I want to track back and, I, and you, you touched on an issue that I'd like to get to in a moment which is this this issue of being open to feedback I, I think it's something that you and Emily both teach and, and share the a sense of the importance of but before we do that I'm struck um, hearing you um, and seeing you here that um, the Bill George at Honeywell or perhaps the Bill George as CEO of Medtronic wouldn't have imagined that one day he'd be sitting in the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard uh, talking about his new book and reflecting on the classes he taught that week. Did, did your understanding of your true north change? Is this the, the latest way that you've expressed it? How do you see the path that you've traveled from from business to uh, academia and, and then ultimately? I feel called to give you an honest answer. So yes, the Bill George at Honeywell, the Bill George at Medtronic, and Bill George at Harvard Physical and George Tech was always searching this and looking for the right place where I was called I should be. And sometimes it took me, I can say I was a slow learner, it took me a long time to get there. The problem for me that I had is myself, my ego kept in getting in the way of that. So I felt since I was, this sounds, you guys are going to think it's crazy, but I have to be honest and say, since I was five years old, I felt like I had a calling to do, to have, make a difference in the world. And I just had to decide where it was going to be and what I was going to do. And I've never wavered from that. But sometimes the world's uh, temptations get in the way. I have a whole chapter here on losing your way. And, uh, and I remember uh, wanting desperately to be a leader and losing seven elections in high school and college and 
having a group of people, uh, seniors at Georgia Tech, get me back on track. Uh, but I also recall, and I recounted in here quite vividly, uh, I was at Honeywell, and my father had planted in my brain the idea I was going to be chief executive of a very major corporation. In fact, when I was eight and nine years old, he even named the companies he wanted me to be in charge of. He gave me a choice of Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, or IBM. Now, you may think that's a joke. I thought it was a pretty heavy trip to lay out a little boy. <laughs> and I actually pushed my father away. I really see myself as a reflection of my mother. But, you know, sometimes subliminally I'm carrying out his unfulfilled desires because he thought he was a failure and never led. He actually was a very good consultant, but he thought he had failed. He never led. So he asked me as his only child uh, to do what he didn't do. So. I found that place, uh, I thought, in 1978, I went to Honeywell, had a fantastic run as uh, uh, President of Honeywell Europe, Middle East and Africa, came back, got a two-step promotion, the worst promotion in my life, because I always wanted to be a value-centered leader with impact people, and in business, that means customers and employees, okay? And that's how I saw my call, and I got thrown into these turnarounds, and I knew what to do, and I could do it, and I did, and I got one set of turnarounds. It took about three and a half years to get done. But more and more, I'm being sitting in conference rooms looking at numbers, which is not what I love to do. I like to be out with people that are using our products uh, or services, talk, getting their feedback, talking to employees and production lines and labs in the field. But I found myself more and more doing that. So then I got a second set. That took about a year and a quarter. That was pretty fast. And I got thrown in the aerospace and defense business. Now, nothing against this business. But it's definitely not where my heart is. I had no passion for the business. In fact, it turned out I didn't. I had passion to become head of this great global company, but I didn't have passion for really for many of its businesses at all. And so, but meanwhile, I'm I'm a problem solver, and I can find a way to solve problems. And I was just toughing it out. And my wife is trying to give me signals I'm going off track. And I remember one day I'm driving home. Those who read the book, it's in the stories in there. But I'm driving home, uh, and. I've been with Honeywell now for 10, 10 years. I'm one of two candidates to become the next CEO. Decisions only made for three, four years. Maybe the leading candidate. And uh, my wife has a great job as a, a consulting psychologist. We have one son in high school, one in junior high. Uh, wonderful friends in Minnesota. It was a beautiful fall day where the leaves are turning. I'm driving home. You would think everything would be fine. And I look in the rearview mirror, and what do I see? A miserable person. It's that flash in the mirror. Everybody had that flash in the mirror. So look at yourself, say, God, good looking. You say, wow, where am I going? And I was really losing it, okay? And I was losing sight of my true north because I was actually trying to give the impression that I was the candidate to be CEO. So I was wearing cufflinks, which I don't wear, trying to impress the board of directors, impress the top management. And it wasn't me. And I was getting farther and farther away from who I was. And so I went home and told my wife, Penny, that she's always been my closest counselor. And she said, Bill, I've been trying to tell you this for a whole year. You just wouldn't listen. <laughs> it's true. I, I was kind of blinded to this. And so I went to this men's group I mentioned. We've been met, meeting every week for over 40 years. Uh, but this time it was about 15. And so I told them I was feeling. He said, well, I've been seeing these changes in you. Now, you turned down Medtronic for a job three times recently as last summer. Why would you do it? And, you know, you'll see the ego coming out here. I said, you know, I always thought I'd come ahead of a major company. I'm trying to come a mid-sized company. My father said a major company. That's what, no, no, it was. It had to be a big corporation. And this one's $750 million, billion market cap. And, you know, about a quarter as many employees that are responsible for it. I mean, just running a sector. But I called the CEO back. I remember getting together with the founder, and all he could talk about was the mission you read. He didn't even interview me. He just wanted to say, did I get the mission? Was I, was I passionate about that? And I remember deciding to go there, walking in the door. I'd never been inside the building. I felt like I was coming home, kind of the feeling this is a place I should be with a group of people I can work with. And we can come together and really make a difference in the lives of the people we serve. And I can tell you, it was the best 13 years of my life. But if I think I hadn't had that awakening, if you will, or crucible, midlife crucible, to realize I was off track. And I was chasing my own, trying to grab for that brass wing. You've seen people do it. It's pretty ugly. And I guess it was ugly when I was doing it, too. So I was getting off track. But I do think I have a pretty good 
if you will, inner moral compass that kind of can say, okay, I'm off track. How do I get back on? I was in the swamp, if you want to use your phrase. How do I get out? But at least I had a way to get out. And people around me in my uh, groups, uh, support groups, and my wife that can help me come back to that. And fortunately, I had an opportunity right there. But one thing I learned, I do teach this every day in the classroom, sometimes in life, you have to close the door behind you before you can see the door open in front of you. You don't walk through that door. And because you're too secure or you, you, you're too caught up in the what that door that you're in now, and, and that door in front of you is wide open like it wasn't been tried, but you can't walk through, so you don't see. It's like walking through into the light and seeing what's there, but until you open that other door. But you really have to close the door behind you. I had to do that with my fiance and I. I had to do it with Honeywell. Uh, my son Jeff has just resigned from a major job, and he's having to do that to open up the door to what comes next. And But I do think, as part of that, it's very dangerous to just close one door and jump into the next one. I think that's why I use the word discernment, and I'm not even sure how I could describe exactly what that means, but I know how important it is. And if you don't do that, if you don't have a vehicle, Sometime every day, like I did to meditate before I came here, something where you're praying, discerning, keeping a journal, reflecting, something where you're not on the black, not on the iPhone, um, and you really are discerning. Then I think it's very easy to get off and get caught up in a task list, or I've got all these jobs to do and I'm behind, and I've got 12 things I've got to get done. Like yesterday, I just had to meditate because I tell you I was had to teach four times today do a dinner so uh, you know but you kind of just can't get caught up in the task well, Emily um, said to me um, by email that uh, she was she resonated with so much that's in your book um, and reflected on the students that she teaches uh, are heading off in very different destinations but the material that you raise and the process that you're describing were very similar Emily did you want to talk a little bit about how um, the materials you've selected in your course and the kinds of questions that students bring to your course uh, are similar and different from what Bill's been described. Well, first of all, just let me say thank you. It's so great to have you here, and it's exciting to hear the way that you're talking about the things that concern us at HDS so much. And uh, I think it's kind of easy to have this picture of businesses not being interested in some of these values and concerns. And so you very much um, bear witness to the fact that not only you, but by the many stories that you tell in the book, you sort of pull back the curtain and show that, in fact, this is right at the heart of what it is to be um, a leader, whether it's a business or in other locations. Um, and so I, I, I sort of do want to use the metaphor of the swamp and say that, you know, I see my students, people say to me, you know, what are your students going to do? What, what do graduates of HDS do? And, and they sort of want me to give them the percentages that are going to be pastors, and you know, that's, that's the question they're asking. And I can't uh, give that answer because I have students who graduate knowing they're not going to be a pastor, who wind up being a pastor of a thousand member congregation, um, you know, and I, vice versa in business. And all I know is every one of them is headed into a swamp. Um, and that's a little bit like the crucible, and it's also a little different. Um, and because the swamp is partly personal, but it's also organizational. And I, I have no doubt that you've dealt with that quite a bit. But I want to think about what tools they need mm -hmm. to navigate their personal swamps that we know they will enter into, and many have already navigated. But also, how are they going to bring other people's wisdom to bear upon the complex problems that they're going to face? And so I see them as sort of orchestra leaders. Um, who need to know how to not just be the only leader, but to help other people bring their gifts forward. So I especially appreciate it in your text where you talked about that. You said it's not just about standing up and telling everybody what to do at all, but it's about learning about yourself. Um, so I, you might be interested here, I always hand out um, fresh new journals to mm -hmm. the students the very first day of class. And the first sound everybody hears is, uh, saran wrap coming off of the, of the mm. journals. And um, the point of that is to make the point that you need to be reflective about yeah. yourself, that this is, this is where it starts. 
So I think we have a lot of resonances um, and find a lot of value in what you've written. Uh, Emily, you had also talked about, um, you and Bill both um, discussed the importance of soliciting feedback. And, and you've got, as you mentioned, your couples group and your men's group. Um, how, how do you get that signal for discernment? What, mm -hmm. how, what, what do you instruct your students and what challenges do they have? Well, and I would really love for you to respond some to this sort of question. I don't really have the answer, but I can describe sure. the problem. Um, you know, as, as he mentioned, I was 10 years a congregational leader, and you get a lot of feedback when you're leading a congregation. <laughs> you know that, right? um, of all kinds. And your book really made the point that you can't be so defensive as a leader that you can't take in some of the things you most need to hear. And most um, damaging is when you set it up so that nobody will tell you anything. Because, yeah, because they, they'll, yeah, they'll you, think you don't want to hear it. They'll think you don't want to hear it, and they won't give you information like, you know, if you if you uh, launch the rocket, it's going to, you know, blow up because it's going to explode. I mean, people won't give crucial information if you cut off that feedback loop. So I talk a lot about how do you um, build and maintain a really good feedback loop, including information about yourself that you don't want to hear. But what? Derek is pointing to is I, I, I wanted to sort of problematize that a little bit because how do you distinguish between somebody saying, you know, you should not expand in Asia and somebody else saying that's exactly what we should do? And um, just to problematize a little more, one of the things about graduate school is that the professor gives you feedback and it's assumed to be good feedback, right? Okay, so you get a C paper or a D paper or whatever, and you can kind of say, oh, what do I need to do differently? But then when you're in the swamp, you're hearing all kinds of things. And that's, I think, where the true north is a big piece, because you, that's what you use to mm -hmm. distinguish between feedback. But I wonder if there's more ways that you would talk about how you sort through problematic feedback and figure out what you really need to hear. Let me just take a step back and say that one of the problems we have at Harvard is we put too much emphasis on the IQ. And this is a barrier to leadership because the <coughs> research shows, that Dan Goldman and others have done, that uh, above a level 120 IQ, which obviously everyone here has, the, just the differentiating factor in leadership is not IQ but EQ, it's emotional intelligence. And I think you can't gain a high level of emotional intelligence unless you're connected with your heart. So if you're uncomfortable sharing your crucible, sharing your difficult times, sharing your weakness, sharing your vulnerabilities, sharing times when you've been in the swamp, if you're uncomfortable doing that, you say, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I think you, it's hard to have high levels of self-awareness. It's hard to connect. We don't connect through our heads. The scholars here think you do. You connect through your heart. And the great leaders have to have strong IQ and strong EQ. And you get that, starts the core of that is self-awareness. And again, you, there's all, I only know, I only have three ways to gain self-awareness, all of which are essential. First of all, you have to process your life story and your crucibles, your time in the swamp. And what caused you to go in there? How did you get stuck in there? And what, what in you did that? Because if you don't, do that in little things, you're going to be susceptible to doing on very large things. And that's a big risk. You may take, I know people have taken a whole organization down. One of the people in this book is one of the most outstanding leaders of our generation, just got out of federal prison 18 months. Okay? Because he hadn't done this work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so then beyond that, I think we have to, now let's go back to your feedback. We need honest feedback. We need to dis distinguish and discern who are the people that really care about us giving us on for you? It may not be a boss. It may not be somebody powerful. They may be using us. It's certainly not sycophants who tell us how great we are. But you have, who are your truth tellers? Who are the people when they see you going off course, they don't just let you walk off the cliff and say, whoa, wait a minute here. What's happening with you? You know, why are you trying to impress all those powerful people? Or why are you trying to do this? Why is that so important? Why are you chasing whatever it is? And uh, and that, under, having people around you, and then listening to them. Mm -hmm. But then I think, 
you have to go off, and when I keep referring this word discernment, for meditation, it can be prayer, it can be journaling, it can be taking a long walk, some people are more comfortable. They have to clear the mind. Because we live in a 24-7 world, and as long as you got this thing out all the time, and you're wondering who just came in since I sat here, and you're thinking about that, you're not really focusing on the big issues. In my case, in meditation, I found it's a beautiful process. I've been working a great deal with people like John Kabat-Zinn, Richard Davidson, probably the leading scholar in the field of neuroscience on this, and Dan Goldman to understand it. I don't really understand the process fully. That's why I try to explore. But I know that process, what happens is you kind of sort out and all the trivia goes away. You know, that all those things on your task list you didn't get done today, it kind of dissipates and you kind of come to yourself. And out of that will come clarity. Whether it's a big decision, it's about a sense of direction, uh, and sometimes it's great creativity. And that's where I go into that. And I think if you don't do that, then you're kind of caught in. Well, the numbers say I'll do this. And I think we don't trust our intuitive uh, capabilities. Intuitive capabilities are essential part of decision. I think all great decisions in business, medicine, certainly two fields I know reasonably well. You can tell about evidence-based medicine. I have a son and daughter who are great doctors. They all practice evidence-based medicine. The decisions they, the key decisions they make are not, they go beyond the evidence. Yeah. They're intuitive. Yeah. And the only, but you can't make intuitive decisions unless you've had a great deal of experience. You can't just pop into it and be intuitive. Right. You know, I could not be intuitive about medicine. I've had no experience. You know, I haven't had a lot of experience working with leaders, so I have intuitions. And every time I don't trust my intuition, I don't trust my gut, so to speak, that this person makes me really uneasy. I really don't trust them. They sound, if you listen to their words, they sounded perfect. But there's something about it that makes me really uneasy. I need to trust that, that instinct, and push it further and explore. What is it? Why do I feel intimidated by this person? Why do I feel backed off? Uh, what is it? And so I think it's that. Those are the ways I think you can get to that process. So it's a combination of, of your introspection, reflection, honest feedback. And you do have to figure out who's going to give you honest feedback and who's working you to get what they want for their selfish purposes. And then processing your own story so that you know your own vulnerabilities. The person I referred to just got out of jail. Had, uh, it, he became an orphan at 18. No one ever knew that. His mother died when he was 16, his father died when he was 18, and he was impoverished, and he was living in India. And he was on the streets, and he had to take care of his sister. And he said, never want that to happen again. Now, by the time that the illegal acts occurred, he was worth $120 million, which for most of us at age 60 is probably enough to kind of crawl through to the end, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but he was seduced by this, by wanting to be a billionaire. Now, are you more impressed with billionaires than you are Somebody you meet in the street? I hope not. You know, I mean, we, we can't judge people, but you get you can get caught up in this world, mm -hmm. and that's his form of swamp. And he he was a great leader. Maybe he'd come back to me. I don't know. Mm. We're going to be able to talk with you. I want to open the conversation up. I've got some questions about how how wide the Charles can be and how we might mm -hmm. narrow it. Um, you talked about servant leadership in your book, and at some point if that comes up. But let me open it up. Who, who has a question for Bill or Emily or an issue you'd like to hear us bad about? Please. Um, so first of all, my son is kept alive by a Medtronic device. So thank oh, you really? For Wonderful. For yeah. Thank you. Can you tell me just a little bit more? It's a, it's a strata shunt that uh, it's a treatment for yeah. hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus, yeah. And, uh, wow. That's a company we acquired a, 20 years ago. A miracle of a device. He's Good. And when did he get? When did he? When did you first diagnose Anderson? When he was born? Four months. Four months. Wow. The only symptom was a, a large head. Must have been a scary time for you. It was very scary. Yeah. Um, Crazy. So, but anyway, so how old is he now? He's three and a half. He's doing okay. He's doing great. He's had just the one surgery and uh, otherwise developing. Wonderful. Great. You made my night. <laughs> So um, my question is, I've, I've done a fair amount of thinking about leadership in the context of greatness. And you mentioned the wonderful Kennedy quote about few of us have you know, the chance to bend history. 
And I think of leadership typically in as a, a collaboration between the leader and the group. And so I wonder about the way we categorize people as great leaders. How much you think that's in, I have an egalitarian bent in me. How much is that about the leader is particularly special versus how much is it about the group or the time or the context is particularly special? All leader has, leadership has to be placed in context. And it's an interaction between the leader, the situation, and the people involved. And if you read my book, you will not find the word follower used. In fact, there's a professor of practice at the Kennedy School who gets very upset with me because she wrote a book called Followership. But I just don't believe in followers. I don't believe your job as a leader to look around and say, how many followers do I have? And unfortunately, some, frankly, some preachers and ministers get caught up into, you know, uh, some of the television evangelists, how many people do I have following me? So I don't think it's about that. It's about how are you empowering other people? And what is the context in which you're working? Uh, and that becomes very, very important. So I think it's that, not, not juxtaposition, but interaction uh, between those forces. And oftentimes you're faced, the situation becomes one of great challenges. So often we think of so-called great leaders because there is a challenge they face, a civil war like Lincoln, and you had to step up to that war. Do you know what I mean? We give, we give great credit to people, but not everyone faces those kind of things, but they still are great leaders because they're great human beings and they go through life that way. Uh, and so I think they have maybe face that situation. Some people shrink from the challenge. People step up to it. Uh, some people make really bad decisions in these challenges, and we pay a price, particularly in national leaders, 10, 20, 30 years later. And I worry about those a lot because I think a lot of those people aren't really prepared for leadership. They haven't done their inner work. They haven't done their processing. They're not as comfortable with diverse points of view. I mean, I was just in Vietnam, if I may take a minute. Uh, first time I'd been there, I was in the Defense Department uh, right after I got out of Harvard Business School in 1966 to 60. I had a privilege of working with some of the most brilliant people ever. Okay, and we were struggling with the Vietnam War, and we finally uncovered falsification of intelligence data and a lot of very serious things. You know, here's some most brilliant people all went to the same schools, very high IQs, very admirable people. They all marched off the cliff together because they had no idea what was going on in Vietnam. I was just there, and it reinforced what I already knew to be true intellectually. I hadn't wanted to go there. My son, Jeff, says, Dad, it's a wonderful place. You've got to go. My son, John, says, go there. Well, I finally did. It is a wonderful place. But why were we fighting a war with these people? Why did three million people die? What was the mm -hmm. benefit of this war? I mean, right now you have communist government. Frankly, all the entrepreneurs happy as can be. They don't fool the government. You know, they don't hear, frankly, the government doesn't make statements like our political candidates are making. You know, I would think in a democracy, statements like that, I wouldn't dare make statements. I wouldn't make them, but I wouldn't dare make statements like some our political leaders are making. It's, these are really, it's, you know, I mean. But I think it's that tendency sometimes, unless you're really engaged and you listen to diverse voices, you can march off the cliff if you just listen to all the people who are saying, so I think that's really a serious issue. And so I think in all of our lives, that's why we need to, that's why this center is so wonderful. You need to seek out people at different faces and say, why is your faith different? You know, what is it? Tell me about your faith. Is there a place we come together? Can we intersect? You know, and are there things we can share? You know, people say Buddhism is not even a religion. Boy, I sure have learned a lot from the Buddhists. I'm not a Buddhist, but I sure have learned a lot about how to live your life and how to do things. I have great admiration for the great Buddhist leaders. So to dismiss that because I'm not a Buddhist is kind of crazy. We just cut ourselves off from, and uh, it, and, and so I, sorry, I just went off a little bit there. I, I, I wanted to uh, make a comment. We do want more questions, but I wanted to just point something out. You no doubt noticed this, um, but the first thing Bill did was listen. Did you notice that? So he's asked a question, but instead of telling, he listened to the person who was asking the question. And I think that's one of the most important markers of leadership, 
it's, I think you were just naturally curious. I don't think you were trying to demonstrate listening no. or something. But, um, you know, I was watching and I was saying, this is so cool, right, Nestor? You've taken my class, and that's how we start. But talking about leadership begins with listening. So I just want to uh, hold that up. I know you also, that's how you operate, too. I'm listening. Oh, so wait. <laughs> the pressure's on. Please. Is it possible to take your principles from business to politics? I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I know you can take them into administrative government, but I just don't know. I haven't studied political leaders. Uh, intuitively, I'm skeptical because, um, to be honest, uh, we're almost developing in politics media celebrities. It's closer to being in the media than it is leading a large organization. And if you study a lot of the people applying for political office, they have not had a lot of leadership experience. They have a lot of opinions. They're very good, I guess, in debating and being on TV, but these aren't always the criteria to be a leader, in my mind. In fact, you know, I don't necessarily buy into Jim Collins' idea that all leaders are humble, but I do think that a lot of leaders who are fantastic leaders, I've been all walks of life, have very low charisma. I think the idea that we're going to put that trip on people, they have to have charisma or style. There is no one right style. We all have to have flexible styles, but the fact that you have to be charismatic. Some of the very best leaders I've known in all walks of life are anything but charismatic. You know, And some of them are humble, more humble than not, but they aren't all humble. Uh, but I, I think in politics we've kind of put this off on people, you know, and and I'll give you an example. My congressman was a man named Jerry Ford, and his great goal in life was to be Speaker of the House, and he lived about a, two blocks from me in Grand Rapids, Michigan, although he really lived in Washington because he had a secure seat. My father even shared his office because he was never there. Um, but, you know, he uh, tripped up and some beat said something about getting an Eastern European country, and. Oh, it's terrible, and he's dead, you know. And he probably did the right thing. I'm not a Nixon fan, but probably did the right thing at Barney because he knew it was going to drive down the country, probably cost him the presidency. So sometimes people doing the right thing are not rewarded in our, in our system. And so I guess it's a tough question. Maybe you have an answer to it, do you? Huh? I appreciate your study. But I'm very discouraged, I have to say. I, I don't watch any of these debates because I, I, I can't go there. In fact, I, let me use the Vietnam analogy, if I may. It's wonderful. You know, everyone, the first time you meet them, they say, well, I'm not really a communist, even the people in the North. But there's all respect for the government. This is the government. It's the power that be. But they operate independently. But they just had an election. No one's even talking about it. It's kind of, they're doing their thing. We're doing ours. We're having a life. We're creating wonderful coffee houses. We've got our own. One guy I met with a great entrepreneur. He's got his own chain that looks like Starbucks, you know, it's not Starbucks, it's called Highlands Coffee, but hey, good for him, you know. But it's kind of like, and I think we're almost obsessed with this, if, if I can be honest, as a nation. It's almost like we're transfixed with these things, rather than looking at what's really important. And I'm not saying these leaders don't have power, though. I wouldn't say President Obama hasn't had a lot of power, or Angela Merkel, who's a wonderful leader, hasn't had a lot of power. Uh, they do. And they have power for good or for ill. I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin, and I think that he has a lot of power. And uh, having excess power in government scares me. Uh, just the way I feel. <laughs> One of the things that um, strikes me, thank you very much, um, reading the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, particularly the five books of Moses, um, is and, and having come from sort of doing some entrepreneurship before I came here, is almost the identification of the idea of freedom, you know, come out of Egypt and now you're free to sort of work the land. Um, and those, those farmers were essentially small business people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there's sort of an, and, and this just baffles me and also just fascinates me, uh, that there's sort of an identification of freedom with the idea of being at risk. Whoever is free is, is in some way at, at risk personally. 
And I was wondering, really, for both of the panelists, it's just something that fascinates me about business and spirituality. If you could sort of um, say what you think about that. You want to go first? Life is about risk. Everything we do in life is a risk. And that's fine, you know? I mean, and frankly, when you take a risk and you fail, I, I would argue you're going to learn more about yourself than you didn't fail, okay? But the freedom you mentioned, with freedom comes responsibility, okay? Uh, and so, I mean, I was just saying to someone coming in, so I'll repeat it. Um, I think this, the United States was formed on the principle of religious freedom and separation of church and state. Many of the early immigrants who came here were seeking religious freedom. And uh, that's wonderful, okay? But I wonder now when I hear people say we're a Christian nation, if you look at what the Jewish people have done who have immigrated to this country, many of them since the 1930, not always by choice, I mean, not, you know, they were left to leave their homeland. It's stunning. It's amazing. Where would this country be without them? You know, and should, you know, should we deport the CEO of Medtronic because he's a devout Muslim? I mean, this is almost absurd that anyone even in the public sphere would say this and get away with it. I just can't understand how do you get away with these statements? You know, we're not a Christian nation. This, this is absurd. You know, no one ever said that. I mean, you know, that, well, that God deems us to be exceptional. I don't know why we're more exceptional than uh, Switzerland or China or any other nation. I mean, I, I'm sure the, the good Lord reaches down and says, you're exceptional and you're not, or says, you are and you're not. I mean, I just I don't believe that. I mean, I think there are seven billion people in this world. We all have a calling to do to use our gifts for a purpose, and that there should be a humility that comes with that. You didn't create your own gifts. In fact, the absence of humility is thinking you created your own gifts. You know, I was so smart because I studied there. No, no, you were born with a lot of that, and you augmented it. One of the things that I'm, <coughs> I'm I'm trying to figure out the, the freedom risk equation that you're... One of the things that struck me in Bill's book is that um, following your true north is not typically a uh, riskless or least risk situation. In fact, in most cases, it's a very lonely place to be. And so in, in those situations, it's actually most important, as I think, as I think you yeah. said, you've got to have that internal compass mm -hmm. because you're not going to get a lot of reinforcement from the outside that, that you're on path. Is, is that something like what you're talking about, the, the freedom to fall as well as to well, succeed? Well, I think that's right. And I think, it's, and I think Bill mentioned it earlier. I, I think there's the idea that you know we're, we're just simply not in control of I, the flip side if we didn't build that. I, Remember when Obama said, you know, you didn't build that, and you got in trouble. You just built that. You know, the flip side of this is that, you know, so it says, uh, forget which book, but, it, you know, it says that God is taking you out of the land of Egypt, which you watered with your feet from the Nile. There was always going to be water from the river. And you're going to go into a land where you depend on the rain from heaven. And either it comes or it doesn't come. You pray for it. It's a risk, year. man. It's a risk, right? And I mean, I know that having been in small business, I have sometimes felt very, very dependent on the rain from heaven. I have no idea where it comes from. And sometimes yeah. it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it may not rain. Sometimes it doesn't rain, and then you start saying, oh, there's a famine, what do we do? Sometimes it rains too much, and it's like, you know. Um, and that, all I can, I don't know what to say about it. That's why I asked the question. I mean, all, all, all the, as far as I've gotten with the idea is that I'm just simply not in control of this. And that's an interesting spiritual discipline to be forced well, to. Well, isn't that a big part of accepting your spirituality is to realize you are not in control? I mean, it, to me, it's pretty arrogant to say you are in control. But look at all the great religions people that the great religions <coughs> admire and look at the risks they took you know you know as gandhi muhammad the great prophets of israel look at the risks they took the risks jesus took 
You know, people are taking enormous risks, you know? And sometimes they pay with their lives. Martin Luther King, another great leader, paid with his life. And he knew it, you know, it's like he, if you read his speech the night before he did, the mountaintop speech, it was almost like a prophetic speech, you know? And so, who knows? But I'm just saying, uh, life is about risk. There are no guarantees in life. Uh, and I think, but we go through life and we, you know, we live those risks and things don't always work out. I used to think good things happen to good people. Guys, I got bad news for you. Good things don't always happen to good people. And by the way, uh, you know, sometimes bad things happen to good people. Doesn't mean you're a bad person though, you know? I mean, those things in life may be better learning experiences, okay? I told you my son just was running for his job. He had a great career. He's going to learn. It sounds philosophical, but I know he's going to learn more in the next six months, maybe in the last six years, uh, about what's really important in life. And he's going to make, he's going to have to, he's going to go through a period of discernment and decide what he wants to do next. But what a great opportunity. I said, Jeff, I wish I'd had this opportunity when I was 42. I was scared to just resign and maybe I'd get a job, maybe I wouldn't. Actually, you can always get a job, you know? So we fear these things. Or, One of the things you made me think about is this, the, the leaving slavery, you know, to, to freedom and then complaining a lot about it. Um, and, and I wanted to tie that back to Bill's concept of this crucible and post-crucible, you know, how do you understand that more deeply so that it guides you and provides you. And I've, I've heard testimony from folks, obviously as a pastor, but in other ways too, who've gone through um, you know, horrifying diagnoses or, or what have you, and maybe not all of them, but a huge percentage of people say they're grateful because they felt a kind of freedom after that, a freedom to be themselves, a freedom to pursue, as um, Bill's wife, Penny, has done, what really matters to right. them, and they experience it as a gift. She would say that. Yeah. She would say that. And it was a gift to the people of Israel to have experienced the crucible of slavery to finally develop their identity so, post-crucible. Let me make a comment on crucible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About six months after the book you have, the original True North, came up, I got a letter from a man named Pedro Algorta. Pedro said, Bill, I read your book, and all of a sudden I felt something coming out of me that I didn't know and a need to pursue it. He said, 35 years ago, I was flying with my Uruguayan rugby team across the Andes Mountains, oh. and our plane went down. And we originally had 120 people on that plane, and 64 survived the crash. And 70 days later, we had no food, we had no water, and we were in street clothes because we weren't dressed for the Andes Mountains. 16 of us walked out alive. You probably heard the book Pierce Ball Read Alive, the movie by the same name. And it is true that they consumed human flesh, and he was confronted with that with some MBAs when he first came. And people said, uh, you know, we're, we're all Catholic here. And we sat around and prayed, and we even had a thing that, you know, it's a little bit like, this, some of this is going to offend something, but please don't take offense. He said, for us as Catholic boys, it was a little bit like what Jesus did, you know. And why not? Hey, and if I die, man, and my... If I can keep you alive, please do that. And he said, he just said to people when they were, some people were being critical of him, he said, what would you do in that circumstance? What would you do? No food for 70 days. And, uh, but he said there are three ways to deal with the crucible. One is, and you see a lot of people doing this, you can be angry and live an angry life looking backward and say, you know, I had, I, I didn't have all the privileges you have, I didn't go to Harvard, I, my life would, you know, I grew up in a poor family, never had a chance, you know, and on and on and on. Okay. And you're not going to have much of a life if you spend the whole way with that, just carrying anger. You see a lot of, unfortunately, some people are now the reason I get upset because I see leaders calling out the worst in people. And we can all find that angry side of us when we work hard enough. The second way is the stuff. I'm not talking about that. He said he went 35 years and never mentioned this to anyone other than his wife. He went to Stanford Business School and never mentioned to one person what had happened. He was just Pedro. 
No one related to it. No one had checked them out. Google them. They didn't have Google in those days. Okay? He never told so. And he said, finally, it's going to come out. And he'd been living a very constrained <coughs> risk to life to avoid all risk. And he was constraining himself. All of a sudden, it came gurgling up, and he found himself. And he said, so think of the third option. Think of the how a pearl is formed. If you think about it, there's an oyster shell on the shore. And the waves keep coming over and over. It's very grating because the sand washes it across that shell. It's incessant. It's there all the time. And finally, the shell, to protect itself, forms a substance called nacre, which the word is, they would call it mother of pearl. That's not the pearl, but inside it forms a beautiful pearl. So think of your life as a pearl. You can think of those difficult times that grade against you, that help shape you. You're in the swamp. You're faced with those difficulties, but they also help shape you. And you could find in that the great pearl of your life. That may be your calling that you didn't have. You thought your calling was X, and you're getting awarded for X. But all of a sudden, you said, no, I should be doing this. This is really what I'm called to do. But you know, I didn't think I'd make a lot of money doing it. I didn't think you'd recognize me, or I had to make give up some things. Yeah, you did. No doubt. I had to take some risks, you know. That, I think that's just a beautiful little story, I think, about the oyster bra. I just share that with you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, there, there was a hand. Oh, please. Okay. Um, so you mentioned people historically have used religion to help answer life's existential yes. questions, but religious participation is declining. Has religious de participation has been declining across yes. the Western world largely? And so I'm curious, we still have these questions to answer. Why is religion on the decline, and how can it stay relevant? Are we not speaking to people's deepest needs? I don't know. It's very worrisome to me. Uh, I remember having this privilege of being on a stage in Zurich with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, presenting the ideas here on authentic leadership, because he was very big, and he calls compassionate authentic leadership. And so I finally said to him, what do you think? it's going to take to have more compassionate, authentic leaders in the world. And he said, you have to have practices. And one of your practices uh, is going to a religious place. One of your practices of meditation, one of your practices, it's like a discipline. If you want to keep your body in shape and you say, you know, I really think it's really important, but I just don't have time to work out. So I haven't worked out in two months. You know, well, your body's going to atrophy. And I think your spiritual life, your religious life, can atrophy if you don't practice it. Uh, I was talking to someone who's a devout Christian, CEO of one of the largest companies in the world. And he said, I'm really concerned. I used to spend every morning, I would get up and spend a half hour reading the Bible, and I'm not doing it anymore. I'm getting away from my faith. Can you help me? Like, I'm not a, I'm not a religious, you know, I'm not a religious leader. I, you know, I just listen to it, you know. And said, yeah, I feel that drifting myself, you know, where I get my nourishment Twice in the last week, there's a wonderful place. We had a condominium, have a condominium on Memorial Drive, one of those old buildings, 1908 or something. And we, um, uh, there's this wonderful place. Uh, I have, since I was, from, I was five, I'm Episcopalian, and there's this wonderful Anglican or Episcopal monastery, St. John. Mm -hmm. And it's just the most wonderful place. And I love to go over there. So I went over there on Sunday, and then I came back on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday service. It was just wonderful to be there. I felt like I was in a really good place. And at the same time, I had an option. I was praying for my son, who was going through extremely difficult times. And uh, so it gave me a chance to really reflect on that and think about it and pray about it. And it just felt like it's going to be OK. And it turned out this week, just today, it turned out OK. I mean, yes, he's going to start a new career, but it's going to be okay. Somebody wanted to constrain him, say he couldn't go to work in his field for the next two years. And, uh, you know, that would be pretty hard if anyone were told, you know, you developed your life to this field and you're in your 40s, but you aren't allowed to work there for two years. You know, you can go off and do something else. Maybe for six months, but not two years. Anyway, that's all I'm getting at. Henry, do you have a response to that? Well, uh, at one time, we thought maybe we'd have Harvey Cox here tonight. Ah, wonderful if Harvey man. was here, I one think he'd heroes. challenge the, the assumption that religious participation is going down. Um, it is changing, and we do have, um, certainly at HDS, we have a wonderful community of people who um, identify as nuns, 
That's mm -hmm. not spelled N-U-N, that's N-O-N-E. So these are some people who um, are not identified religiously, but are deeply concerned with what matters most in the human community. Um, but I think worldwide it's very hard to make an argument that religious participation is going down. One of the things Harvey says is, you know, he wrote, you know, The Secular City, and he said he's been more surprised than anybody that what he predicted, that we would just become a secular society, to just factually not really? happen. Yeah, so I mean, good worldwide, news. there's good more news. interest in religion and more experience. Is, is that a fair okay, so statement good. of Harvey? I don't want to misrepresent him. Harvey, if I misrepresented you, I, I apologize. Uh, uh, can I make <laughs> a contentious statement? Okay. Oh, please, I, really yeah, yeah, let's do that. Chris. Okay. <laughs> Man is not God. And men, women, who put themselves out to be in religious roles uh, often can cause great harm. Okay, they can separate people rather than bring them together. They can cause people to feel rejected. We now have, I'm not a Roman Catholic, we have a wonderful Pope, you know, and he ask him, they ask him about how do you feel about, uh, uh, about gays, and he said, who am I to judge? Yeah, just simple statement, five words, you know. Uh, it's not his to judge, you know. And I think the idea of acceptance of people as opposed to rejection. Mm -hmm. I remember John Kerry uh, was denied, when he was running for president of the United States, he was denied the opportunity, he's a Roman Catholic, lives here, to take communion in Phoenix because he had, yeah. he's in favor of abortion. Right. Okay? Now, we each have to make our own mind up about that. I'm not taking a position on it, but I think... You know, who are we to judge, you know, him? And I think we've had too much, in my own view, we've had too much judgmentalism on the part of people in, in faith, you know? And I think a more humble, modest approach, saying, uh, would be much more helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I see a lot of times that our religious leaders are separating us. Anyone ever been to a church where the minister stands up and said, all Muslims are terrorists? I mean, these things go on, you know? And we had, Christians had the same prejudice against Jewish people 40, 50 years ago. Now it's, people wouldn't say that, but we have to be honest and say that. I mean, how were African Americans treated in this country? And, you know, there is such a thing as Jim Wallace, by the way, has written it. I don't know if you know Jim Wallace. He's mm -hmm. one of my, sure. my mentors. Um, he's written a wonderful new book called America's Original Sin. He goes into great depth. <coughs> Why? Uh, racism, slavery, it was just, wasn't just slavery, it's why racism is America's original sin and how we've never really dealt with it. And I remember going to Germany uh, last June, and there was this <clears throat> amazing, if you will, in Jewish terms, an atonement on the part of the German people for what had happened. I was walking just by Brandenburg Gate, and you know, there's this amazing Holocaust Museum, you know? And you go two blocks from there, a thing's called Night of Terror, and everything that ever happened in Germany is laid out in very explicit terms in German and English. No German school child can ever possibly miss what happened. Can anyone find here in the United States where you can find really honest statements where we can all go study, students, young people can study what we did to Native American people? Can anyone find that? I've been to the Museum of the American, American Indian in Washington. It's cultural, but it's there's no anything close to that. Nelson Mandela led this reconciliation. I think this commission was a wonderful thing, you know? But, you know, are we going to do that for African Americans? Has anyone ever stood up and said, we wronged people? You know, let's, let's call it what it is, you know? And we repent, you know, and that's what Wallace is saying. We need to, we need to do that as a way of coming together as a people. And so, you don't have to buy into any of that. But it's worth reading the book. <laughs> it's called America's Original Sin. Please, in the corner. Thank you. Um, to follow up on what you were just talking about, I would love to hear how, kind of, for you to expand on that and how leaders um, are can be obligated or how leaders can use their own privilege and their own power to lift up those who are not in privilege and not in power. Because I see leadership as not something that stops with the individual, but ripples out into community to transform entire communities instead of just the individual. hope they got that on tape, because that really is our calling as leaders. That's really what we're called to do. 
to empower other people to lead, not to get people to follow us. We don't have all the answers. That's what you were saying too, you know, to learn how to listen. But it's to empower other people to lead. That's today's great leaders are very empowering to get other people to step up and lead. And that's what they do and try to give, take their gifts and bring them together to make this world a better place in whatever field you want to call. I mean, you know, we're not going to eliminate, you know, hunger and poverty and strife, but we certainly can call out the best in people to join together to try to make it that way instead of setting people off against each other for fault, what I call false reasons. Setting people off against each other for religious reasons is a false reason or creating false conditions to gain power. And so I think great leaders today are empowering leaders. It's not about exerting power over other people. It's empowering other people to step up and lead. That's what great leaders do. They call us to do that. They call out the best in us and ask us to use our gifts to help other people. And isn't that what we're all called to do in our lives? Mr. G. <clears throat> well, uh, first I want to say thank you for being uh, vulnerable and sharing stories from your personal life. I really appreciate that. And I've learned a lot from Derek. I've learned a lot from Emily. I think the greatest lessons I've learned are questions. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you is when it comes to authentic leadership or before falling off the cliff or when people's paths cross, what are good questions to ask oneself in discernment? Am I following the path that I'm called to be on? This is really my calling, or am I following something else that somebody else wants for me? Or are there are certain rewards if I follow this path, but is that really the right path for me? Monetary rewards, status rewards, fame, power rewards. Am I getting too caught up in that? What are my intrinsic motivations, and am I li listening to the call? Do I have ways to discern and listen to the call? And can I pull back? And do I have truth tellers around me that will help me say, Bill, you're going off track here, man. You know, you've got to get back with it. Why are you trying to impress all those people? You know, like you mentioned my title, senior fellow. I had a bigger title a year and a half ago. Who cares? Does anyone care what the title is? No, seriously. I had a boss tell me, without a title, I'm nothing. Does anyone care? He's Derek, right? I don't even know what your title is. Does it matter? You know, you're I'm like, you know I'm just saying we get caught up. So do I ask myself the question, whose path is this? Why am I pursuing? And what, at the end, if I reach, if I follow that path, uh, am I really fulfilling what I consider my calling? Please. Um, I read your book, Leadership Lessons, and I read your interview with the McKinsey on capitalism for the long term last yes. year. Yes. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you for that. And I also follow me up with the discussions that took place uh -huh. um, and I know you actually was leading one session related to that. Mm -hmm. um, well, this year's Davos, you know, world leaders, you know, from the business community, political community, they were gathered and discussing about how you know technological development would you know impact the entire world. And when you talk about this, you know, new market, new technology coming up, um, and uh, maybe pushing towards other new huge opportunities and you know when that happens there are always you know there are always like losers um you know there are always what like losers um you know for example like if we come up with with a you know um cars you know that we wouldn't need to have any like drivers yeah um, self-driving cars sure yeah. so you know then then you know, people lose, like, you know, the drivers, who, the people who used to be drivers, they would lose jobs, right? I mean, this is just an example, but when all these, like, industrial industrial revolutions take place, it, it just, you know, changes the structure of the economy, and, and it really creates a population, a certain population that, you know, the society, like, leaves behind. Um, and, you, you know, as a business decision maker, and as a policy maker, I, I think, you know, we know that we have to move forward to yeah. the next level. But as a person with the faith, um, how, you know, <laughs> it's hard, right? 
I think we sometimes give too much power to technology and to science. That becomes our guide. And uh, technology is not going to replace human beings. They're not going to replace interactions like this. We can do it on computerized telepresence or you know Google Hangout or something. It's not going to be the same. And so I think that, but education is really critical. And the lead behind you're referring to are people. Education needs to go from something you get in the first 22 to 25 years. And I've talked to our president about that. Because I think we're way too focused here at Harvard on education in the first 25 years. I mean, think back to some of you who are in, uh, over 50. Uh, you know, think what you learned and think how much you've learned since then. We need lifelong learning. You all are in a learning environment, but a lot of people are not. And we don't afford them the opportunity to continue their learning. You can't stop learning. I think everyone should come back into an academic environment. Education, that's why I teach exec ed. You know, every five to six years, or maybe every year or something, where you're enhancing your learning, and we've left people behind because we are not helping them continue their learning. I was a big advocate when President Obama took over and we never could get through Congress, the idea that, you know, we would provide a lot of opportunities to help people <coughs> augment their education. Of course, people's jobs are being replaced by machines, but we can't let machines become our gods anymore. We can let science become our god. We really have to help people with process education be able to take on our higher level capabilities and to create those opportunities. And I think we've fallen away from that. And frankly, if you go to the political rift in this country right now, there are a large number of people that feel like when they say things like we want our country back, it's they feel like they have lost the opportunity to do anything and the world has passed them by. Well, that's a shame, but shame on us for not helping them continue their education. Actually, Germany's done a much better job of this. If you look at what Germany does to continue, and the apprentice system and how people, you talk to German factory workers, they're proud as can be. They're never going to be CEO Siemens or BMW, but I tell you, they're really proud of their work and they have good holidays, good pensions, and secure work. We don't. We take a lot of that away. And so this capitalism in the long term, we're moving to short term, short term, short term. It's getting shorter all the time, and the pressures of that are destroying, destroying a lot of great things. And it's very upsetting to me. You get me off on a different subject, but I can tell you, I, if you want to see me get very upset, we get on this subject. Uh, no, seriously, I was teaching a case on today about someone who wanted to destroy a 112-year-old company. And uh, this same person just did destroy a 212-year-old company, a company called DuPont, mm -hmm. one of the great companies of the world. Any of you ever wear nylon clothes, rayon clothes, use Teflon pans, solar cells? They invented all these things. They just shut down their laboratories, their science center, and laid all the scientists off. Instead of finding jobs. It's a disaster. I mean, you got to call it what it is. For what? So some short-term investors make a couple of another couple bucks a share. I don't even think it'll create any shareholder value in the long run. I think there won't be any shareholder value. And it worries me a great deal that we're losing sight. Capitalism there is served there to serve people, not to serve the almighty shareholder. And if you don't do that, it self-destructs. You don't believe me? Look at what happened in the era of Enron and all those companies, WorldCom, Tyco, a whole bunch of others. But also look what happened in the financial collapse of 2008 and 9. How many people were harmed by that? It was almost, it almost self-destructed because there were no limits on capitalism. Capitalism needs limits. I'll just say it bluntly. If you don't put limits on it, it will self-destruct. We're getting off of the subject, Derek. I realize that. But no, but leaders need to stand up to this and say this is wrong. I think you're, uh, you're absolutely on the subject. Uh -huh. go. I, I need to call us to a close, but I have a question that I wanted to ask you, and it, it was because I um, discovered that we share a great admiration for Warren Bennis. Mm -hmm. And um, he had written an article uh, called Does Religion Belong in the B-School yes. Curriculum? To which his answer was a resounding yes. And I think the reason that he said that was that um, he thought if we're teaching global leadership, then we need people need to understand the importance and impact of religion around the world. Yeah. That, that was his thought. But uh, I was wondering if you can put it exactly the other way. Does business belong in the divinity school curriculum? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, just if, if your respective schools could do, our respective schools could do one thing 
constructive in that direction to bring the domains together. What what should we do? Talk about it. I mean, you know, Warren's Jewish. About remember the Jewish faith, okay? And Jewish people don't proselytize. And I think one of the great fears of religion proselytizing. I remember hearing the Dalai Lama say, you know, I'm not trying to ask you to be a Buddhist. If you're a Jew, I want you to be a better Jew. If you're a Muslim, I want you to be a better Muslim. If you're an atheist, I want you to be a better Muslim and look out for humanity. If you're a nun, if you call it uh, N-O-N-E, uh, I want you to be better at what you do. He's not proselytizing. But I think we need to talk about it. You know, I, I've got, I've introduced a lot of case HBS and it upset some people, but we talked about it, about a guy in my classroom that he was at his wit's end, he was losing his company, his grandfather started, and a, a close friend of mine, and he didn't know what to do, and so he fell on his knees and started praying. And I said, does this worry anyone? Oh yeah, it's terrible, was he a weak guy? You know, he, he said, no, he was there. And he said, I got up the next morning, and I'll tell you, I was energized and ready to go back. And, uh, God wasn't pulling me out of the problem, but he was gonna you know, walk with me in some kind of spiritual sense. And so, uh, why can't we talk about these things in a classroom? Why can't we say, you know, I'm an atheist and I'm proud of it, good, okay? Can I ask you, how do you deal with the existential, as extent, existential questions of life? That's not a religious question. I mean, how do you deal with it, you know? Is it just eat, drink, and be merry? Then we can all go to uh, what's called Billionaire's Row in Manhattan and get ourselves a $90 million apartment like the activist <laughs> Bill Ackman did. You know, and that can be your contribution to humanity. Sorry to be a cynic, but sometimes you've got to call things what they are. You know, give it away. If you got it, give it away. You're not, how many of you ever believe that you're going to take a dime with you when you leave this earth? Any religious <laughs> belief in that? Okay, so why not give it away? You know, maybe don't do it all at once, but why not give it? You know, you didn't create your own wealth. You think you did. You didn't create it. If you're blessed because things come your way, great, give it back. You're blessed with intelligence. Give it back. Share it. Don't hoard it. You know, remember the story in the Bible about that Jesus tells the story in the Bible about the person buried his talents. You know? Yeah, we all, we got to share it. So, anyway, I do think we need to talk about it, and why can't we? Why can't we talk about it? What's wrong? Is, is anyone, are we afraid of it? I suppose if you think I'm going to proselytize, uh, yeah, you should be afraid of it. But aren't, aren't we legitimately, isn't that what we do at Harvard? is talk about really important issues. Who can say these questions we've been talking about tonight are not important? Can anyone honestly say that, that these are not important questions, and the questions being asked? Uh, so why don't we talk about it? Is there any harm in that here at the Divinity School? No, and I, I, I'll just uh, say very briefly that I think um, we talk about it, but we need to talk about it um, trusting in the depth and complexity yeah. of the other. <laughs> so that, you know, we need to stop talking about business as a paper tiger. You know, they're all bad, corporations are all bad, and they're all the same, and we know how bad they are. You know, we can fall into that here on this side of the river. As you have said, at the business school, you can fall into everybody's going to try and proselytize, mm -hmm. and just ignoring the complexity of what it is to be observant and deeply concerned. So that, that would be my brief suggestion, is stop treating each other as paper tigers yeah. and, and embrace the complexity. A thousand mile journey across the river, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At least, now we got to credit President Drew Faust for trying to bring us back together. She really is working yeah, hard at doing that. And every dean she's made, the amazing thing about Drew is she's made amazing appointments of deans here. I mean, really remarkable, inspired, but you know, things she asks of every dean. I want you to be committed to Harvard as a whole. Yeah. One Harvard, not just your own school. We have a great dean here. But she's made great appointments. She understands the value of a team. You know, and so I have to I want to credit her for what she's doing. I hope you all will support that idea. Things like this are uh, encouraging. Bill and Emily, this has been a gift and a blessing. You and Abhishek, you are a bridge builder. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.